Mm, ah, mm, 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 mm. Oh, yeah. Hello, guys. Anyway, I am a little tired today, but oh well. I still have a bunch of work to do and still have things to do. And uh, Monica still has her Pokemon Go to play. Yep, 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 yep. <sighs> Not me. Well, maybe later. Anyway, uh, we have today book 11 of the Dresden Files. This one is Turncoat. So you guys can go ahead and grab your copy of the book, like, share, and subscribe. Ah, looks like a beautiful day today, but it says it's supposed to snow. Which, I mean, I'm not upset at the snow. That means it's not freezing, because if it's snowing, it's warm enough to snow. That may sound funny to some of you guys out there, but that's the truth. Because it can be too cold to snow. And then you just get things that you don't want, like a hail or like a freezing mist. Ugh. Or things like that. But anyway, we are on chapter 18 today. So hopefully you guys can like, share, and subscribe and read along with me. <clears throat> the handy part about writing with a cop was that she has the cool toys to make it simpler to get places quickly, even on a Chicago busy morning. The car was still bouncing from sweeping into the street from a little parking lot next to my apartment when she slapped the whirling blue light on the roof and started a siren. That part was pretty neat. The rest of the ride wasn't nearly as fun. Moving fast through a crowded city is a relative term. And in Chicago, it meant a lot of rapid acceleration and sudden braking. We went through half a dozen alleys, hopped one bad intersection by driving up over the curb through a parking lot, and swerved through traffic at such a rate that my freshly embedded coffee and donuts started swirling and sloshing around in a distinctly unpleasant fashion. Kill the noise and light, I said a couple of blocks from the storage park. She did it, asking, why? Because whatever is there, there are several of them, and Thomas didn't think he could handle them. I drew my forty-four out of my duster pocket and checked it. Nothing's on fire. So let's hope that nothing's gone down yet, and we'll be all sneaky-like until we know what's happening. Still with the revolvers? Murphy said, shaking her head. She drove past the street leading to the storage units and went one block past it instead before she turned and parked. When are you going to get a serious gun? Look, I said, just because you've got twice as many bullets as me, three times as many, Murphy said. The SIG holds 20. Ooh, 20. Look, the point is that, and it reloads a lot faster, you've got some loose rounds in the bottom of your pocket, right? No speed loader? I stuck the gun back in my pocket and tried to make sure none of the bullets fell out as we got out of the car. That's not the point. Murphy shook her head. Damn, Dresden. I know the revolver is going to work, I said, starting toward the storage park. I've seen automatics jam before. New ones? Well, no. Murphy had placed her own gun in the pocket of her light sports jacket. It's a good thing you've got options. That's all I'm saying. If a revolver was good enough for Indiana Jones, I said, it's good enough for me. He was a fictional character, Harry. Her mouth curved up in a small smile. And he had a whip. I eyed her. Her eyes sparkled. Do you have a whip, Dresden? I eyed her even more. Murphy, are you coming on to me? She laughed, her smile white and fierce as we rounded a corner and found the white rental van where Thomas had left it, across the street from the storage park. Two men in similar gray suits and gray fedoras were standing nonchalantly in a summer morning sunshine on the sidewalk next to the van. 
on second glance, they were wearing the exact same gray suit, the exact same gray hat. In fact, feds? I asked Murphy quietly as we turned down the sidewalk. Even feds shop at different stores, she said. I'm getting a weird vibe here, Harry. I turned my head and checked out the storage park through the 10 foot high black metal fencing that surrounded it. I saw another pair of men in gray suits going down one row of storage units. Two more pairs were on the next and two more on the one after that. That makes 12, Murphy murmured to me. She hadn't even turned her head. Murphy had cop powers of observation, all in the same suit. Yeah, they're from out of town, I said. A lot of times when beings from the never never want to blend in, they pick a look and go with it. I thought about it for a couple of steps. The fact that they all picked the same look might mean they don't have much going for them in the way of individuality. Meaning, I'd only have to go on a date with one of them to know about the rest, Murphy asked me. Meaning that you need a sense of self to have a sense of self-preservation. Murphy exhaled slowly. Oh, that's just great. She moved a hand toward her other pocket, where I knew she kept her cell. More manpower might help. Might set them off, too, I said. I'm just saying, if the music starts, don't get soft and shoot somebody in the leg or something. You've seen too many movies, Harry, she said. If cops pull the trigger, it's because they intend to kill someone. We leave the trick shots to SWAT snipers in Indiana Jones. I looked at the booth beside the entrance to the storage park. There was normally an attendant there during the day, but there was no one in the booth, or in sight on the street for that matter. Where's your unit? Murphy asked. I waggled my eyebrows at her. Right where it's always been, doll face. She made a noise that sounded like someone about to throw up. First row, past the middle, I said, down at the far end of the park. We have to walk past those jokers by the van to see it? Yeah, I said, but I don't think these suits have found it yet. They're still here, and still looking. If they had located Morgan, they'd be gone already. As we approached, I noticed that the two tires next to the curb on the white rental van were flat. They're worried about a getaway, I said. Are you sure they aren't human? Murphy asked. Um, reasonably. She shook her head. Not good enough. Are they from the spirit world or not? Might not be able to tell until we get closer, I said. Might even need to touch one of them. She took a slow, deep breath. As soon as you're certain, she said, tell me. Shake your head if you're sure they aren't human. Nod if you can't tell or if they are. We were less than 20 feet away from the van, and there was no time to argue or ask questions. Okay. I took a few steps and ran smack into a curtain of nauseating energy so thick and heavy that it made my hair stand on end, a dead giveaway of a hostile supernatural presence. I twitched my head in a quick shake as the two men in gray suits spun around at precisely the same time, at precisely the same speed to face me. Both of them opened their mouths. Before any sound came out, Murphy produced her sidearm and shot them both in the head. Twice. Each. Double tapping the target like that is a professional killer's policy. There's a small chance that a bullet to the head might strike a target at an oblique angle and clone him off of the skull. It isn't a huge possibility. But a double tap drops the odds from very unlikely to virtually impossible. Murphy was a cop and a competition shooter. And less than five feet away from her targets, she did the whole thing in one smooth move, the shots coming as a single pulsing hammer of sound. The men in gray suits didn't have time to so much as register her presence, much less do anything to avoid their fate. Clear liquid exploded from their backs of their skulls and both men dropped to the sidewalk like ragdolls, their bodies and outfits deforming like a snowman in the spring, leaving behind nothing but ectoplasm, the translucent, 
gooey gel that was the matter of the Never Never. Hell's bells, I choked as my adrenaline spiked after the fact. Murphy kept the gun on the two until it was obvious they weren't going to take up a second career as a headless horseman. Then she looked up and down the street, her cold blue eyes scanning for more threats as she popped the almost full clip from the SIG and slapped a fully loaded one back in. She may look like somebody's favorite aunt, but Murphy can play hardball. A couple of seconds later, what sounded like the howls of a gang of rabid band saws filled the air. There were a lot more than 12 of them. Come on, I shouted and sprinted forward. The gray suits weren't individualists. It wasn't unthinkable that they would possess some kind of shared consciousness. Whacking the lookouts had obviously both alerted and enraged the others, and I figured that they would respond the way any colony conscious does when one of its members gets attacked. The gray suits are coming to kill us. We couldn't afford to run, not when they were this close to Morgan and Molly, but if the gray suits caught us on the open street, we were hosed. Our only chance was to move forward fast and get into the storage park where they were screaming out of it. Looking for us, if we were quick enough, we might have time to get to the storage unit, collect Morgan and company, and make a quick escape through the portal in the floor and into the Never Never. I pounded across the street and through the entrance with Murphy on my heels. I threw myself forward as the howls grew louder and made it into the center row just about 20 or 25 gray suits came rushing out from the other rows. Some of them saw us and slammed on the brakes, throwing up gravel with their expensive shoes, pulling up a new tone of howl. The others bleededly begin to turn as well. And then we were all the way into the center row of storage units, still moving at a dead run. The gray suits rushed after us, but Murphy and I had a good 40-yard lead, and they didn't appear to be superhumanly light on their feet. We were going to make it. Then I remembered that the door to the storage unit bay was locked shut. I fumbled for the key as I ran, trying to pull it out of the front pocket of my jeans so that it would be ready. I figured that if I didn't get the door unlocked and open on the first try, the gray suits would catch up to us and kill us both. So naturally, I dropped the damn key. I cursed and slid to a stop, slipping on the gravel. I looked around wildly for the dropped key, horribly aware of the mob gray suits rushing toward us, now in eerie silence. Harry, Murphy said, I know. She appeared beside me in a shooting stance, aiming at the nearest gray suit. Harry, I know. Metal gleamed amongst the gravel and I swooped down on it as Murphy opened fire with precise, measured shots, sending the nearest gray suit into a tumbling sprawl, and the others just vaulted over him and kept coming. I'd found the key, but it was already too late. Neither of us was going to make it to the shelter of my hideaway. <gasps> and that's it. That's the whole chapter. So, you guys will have to stay tuned and see what happens... <laughs> what are Murphy and Harry going to do now that they're out in the middle in the open and they've got, uh, in the words of another um, person that I just listened to, bajillions of gray suits coming towards them. Well, more like 40, but that's close enough. Anyway, if you guys want to hear the next chapter, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And we'll hurry up and try and get that next chapter out for you. Again, you all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day.